This is a continuation of the Howison Lecture by Professor Jürgen Habermas, for which we're indebted to the Howison Fund for providing support for these lectures. He spoke last night at International House, and this is a continuation of that lecture, as he's going to point out, I'll point it out too. It presupposes what he was talking about there. Uh, he'll talk for approximately an hour, is that right? And then there will be a discussion, which could be the, a follow-up discussion on both of the lectures. The title of the lecture this afternoon is Morality, Law, and Politics. Thank you, Bert. Uh, I'm quite surprised that this is called a seminar in the United States, I mean. But uh, uh, I will adapt to this situation and uh, give just another lecture. Um, please, there is an alternative to this acoustic arrangement, namely to turn it off. So I will ask you in five minutes whether we will be better off to do it without. Um, I want to present a rather, a rather con condensed version of uh, something of uh, 100 pages. To make it even worse, what I dare to present is uh, only reflecting a work in progress, uh, no finished product. As I have yesterday taken up basic issues of the tradition of moral philosophy with a straight systematic intent, today I will proceed in a similar way with the tradition of contractarian theories in modern uh, natural law. I will address the same issues which we know from this context uh, but using different premises and a different conceptual frame. I will just start, instead of defining the natural state, um, with uh, two basic problems that any collective reformation in any society has to face, and uh, then go on to analyze what we find as strategies to solve these problems, so to say, in a crazy empirical way. And then, in the same vein as these contractarian theories, I will continue with a thought experiment, namely just asking how could one transfer these more or less natural uh, strategies of problem solving into something more natural. The result of this thought experiment is then that uh, uh, nothing will be achieved except that we would uh, rely on law and politics as a medium through which one could implement uh, rational collective well formation. Now this leads me then to uh, this whole complex of uh, law and politics that I very briefly introduce in terms of a conceptual genesis, if you like. Um, then uh, returning to the question whether it is possible to implement rational collective world formation through these media without distorting already on that abstract level, just in terms of structural constraints, without, cons without distorting the rationality of a supposedly um, working um, collective will formation. Now this leads me then to the idea of uh, an entwinement or interpenetration, interpenetration of two types of procedures, legal and argumentative, that can be illustrated in terms of legal or in the cases of legal discourse. 
And uh, finally then, I will use this whole uh, discourse theoretic approach to uh, propose a reconstruction of the normative content of uh, the uh, democratic constitutional uh, state. I will give a somewhat unusual leaning to principles of uh, people's sovereignty or to human rights as guidelines for the institutionalization of those communicative practices which are supposed to frame rational collective will formation. Of course, uh, you will immediately ask me why fall back to uh, contractarian theories of that highly constructive and idealizing kind after we have gone through the historical way of thinking since the 19th century. I will leave that issue for the discussion. Uh, now that I have explained to you what will happen, please don't take it as a rhetorical uh, device. If I uh, invite all of you who came with understandably different expectations rather to leave the room. I mean, I uh, would not only not mind, but would be uh, glad to see that uh, uh, my chance to disappoint you uh, uh, diminished. I mean, so. Now, please. I, uh, let me first focus on what uh, was uh, at that time, 17th century, 18th century, called a natural state as against society. Following Parsons, I presume that social interactions occur under conditions of double contingency. That simply means the actors expect of one another that each can decide both in one way and the other. As a consequence, every social order which, with relatively stable behavioral patterns has to rely on some mechanisms for action coordination, basically on influence and, that's a clearly empirical uh, item, either on influence or on processes of reaching understanding. I won't go into this. If such coordination is not forthcoming, more or less anomic sequences of action arises, and what is more important, the participants themselves then experience such uncertainties as a problem. Problems of this sort exist basically in two typical versions. They have to do either with the regulation of a conflict brought about by contradictory, by contradictory individual action orientations or with the selection and cooperative realization of collective goals. Let's simply talk about the regulation of interpersonal conflicts versus the pursuit of collective goals and programs. In the simplest case, several actors argue over one and the same piece of property and wish to solve this conflict by reaching some sort of agreement. Or, it's the other type, several actors all come up against a challenge in the same situation and wish to overcome it cooperatively. Agreement and cooperation are just the premises. In the former case, the participants face the question according to which rules should we live together, and in the latter case, the question is that of which goals do we want to reach and how do we want to achieve them. In short, collective will formation refers to the stabilization of behavioral expectations in the case of 
conflict or to the specification and effective realization of collective goals. Parsons, of course, speaks of better maintenance and goal attainment. Now, let, let us further assume that uh, simple interactions spread over a continuum bordered on the one side by value-oriented and on the other side by interest-oriented or interest-based action. I mean, values can be shared and interests by, defi by definition are uh, uh, my interests. Depending on the relevance and the thematization of either the one or the other aspect, the actors themselves, again, have to adopt different attitudes in these two types of actions. Namely, either the performative attitude of an actor oriented to reaching understanding or the objectivating attitude of an actor who, in light of his own preferences, orients himself towards the consequences of uh, actions and events. Problems of action coordination are perceived and processed in different ways depending on the actor's perspective and the type of action involved. The practice of reaching understanding distinguishes itself from uh, that of the bargaining process in terms of the objectives entailed. The agreement aimed for is understood in the first case as consensus, in the second case as some sort of a balancing of uh, interests. Now, may I ask you, do you, do you have this uh, handout? I mean, okay. Now, for the continuation of problems, and how is it with uh, the micro? I mean, it works out. Well. Okay. From uh, the continuation, or from the combination, excuse me. From the combination, now look at this sheet here. From the combination of problems, on the one hand, two types of problems, and of actors' perspectives, either in value oriented or in uh, interest oriented actions. The, uh, you get then the criteria for a rough classification of uh, basic problem-solving strategies. <coughs> the two conflict regulation, the two, two conflict regulating strategies in the left column up can be described under the headings of consensus and arbitration. Given conditions of value-oriented action, there is a prospect that a conflict can be resolved by the parties on the basis of shared values. Given conditions of interest-oriented action, there is a prospect that a conflict can be resolved by a balance of interests on the basis of factual power uh, positions, normally in terms of a compensation for damages. The two strategies for goal setting can be brought under the heading of authority and uh, compromise. This is the second uh, column. Either individual persons or families enjoy sufficient prestige to give an authoritative interpretation of shared values and beliefs, or the parties to the quarrel arrive at a tolerable compromise, again, depending on their actual power. Now, one could, and we can come back to that in the discussion, one could illustrate these four strategies by anthropological uh, evidence for uh, institutions, for uh, different types of uh, yeah, problem solving of that interactional kind. However, none of these problem solving strategies so far neutralize power relations. All of them rather lead 
to results which either directly or in a less visible way depend on the contingent power positions involved, including, of course, such power constellations as are expressed in prestige differentials or even lie concealed behind value, shared value beliefs. If we now follow the train of contractarian thought, a switch over to um, rational collective uh, will formation will be not surprising. I mean, the, the whole setup of those contractarian theories had been idealizing constructions. Now, we, can, we cannot do it uh, in the same way today, but we can just uh, uh, declare this switch as a thought experiment. I mean, this is something trivial. Now, such a switch over now to rational collective uh, will formation would imply that these problem-solving strategies which we find, so to say, in the natural uh, state, in fact, in kinship-based societies, um, that these strategies can be freed from their enchainment to such power laden context. A thought experiment that I cannot carry out here in detail would allow us to point a clean, to paint a clear picture of rational collective will formation. You can look uh, at the line, uh, at the bottom line. On the one hand, moral discourses of justification and application would permit an impartial regulation of interpersonal conflicts that is free from ideologies and factual power impositions. And on the other side, pragmatic discourses, along with compromises and with the ethical clarification of collective identities, would yield to a discursive form of goal setting, no longer prejudiced and disturbed by constellations of prestige and power. If I now use uh, terms like moral and ethical and pragmatic, just associate what you got from yesterday evening. And yet, in a certain sense, such a thought experiment would remain fruitless, even granted the counterfactual assumption that both the practices of consensus formation and of bargaining were raised to the level of rational standards. The rational problem-solving strategies would leave the coordination problem unresolved in a non-trivial sense. These are in your uh, chart uh, the unsolved uh, problems in the bottom line. Um, with respect to conflict regulation, the problems of imputation arises, and with respect to the pursuit of collective goals and programs, the problem of empowerment occurs. Let me briefly explain this. In modern discourses, the validity of a norm is always tested under the premise of its being universally adhered to Kantian idea. Norms which have stood this test can therefore only be imputed to someone who can be certain that everybody else orients their action, his or her action, to it as does he himself. A post-conventional, a post-traditional morality of the Kantian type, of the deontological type, cannot provide such a certainty. Of course not. 
in order to grant certainty, morally valid norms would have beforehand to be transformed into legally binding norms. On the other hand, rationally motivated agreement on goals and programs remain ineffective until the corresponding resolutions empower and simultaneously bind the executive bodies involved. But rational collective reformation is not as such a process that generates, that generates power. I mean, Hannah Arendt thought one, one could make an argument for that, but I don't think that this works. Only if it were to be linked, I mean, this process of collective reformation, only if it were linked to political power would it be possible to confer competencies uh, on executive bodies and to supervise the implementation of the input. Thus, the functional requirements, it's nothing else, the functional requirements of law and politics can themselves be explained in terms of the conditions necessary for a rational collective reformation that involves imputable and effective. Contractarian theories face the problem of the transition from a natural state to society, an equivalent of this would be, in my design, the question as to how rational collective reformation can, without distortion, proceed within the medium of law and political power. Now, uh, I come to the second uh, um, part. Uh, the law and power complex, maybe you find that a bit uh, difficult. Now, uh, contractarian theories, I mean, I knew it just in a different way than contractarian theories did it, and, and that seems to be, uh, for me, it seems uh, to be important. Contractarian theories traditionally operate with two basic concepts. Just think of Hobbes. Just think of the Leviathan. Namely, they have the concept of uh, the sovereign's factual power to issue commands, as well. And, on the other hand, the concept of the rule structure of legal norms. Norms that are conceptualized in a modern sense that assign equal liberties for private actors. Now, political authority in these theories is then conceived as a sovereign will resuming and exercising legislative functions. The will of the sovereign then expresses itself in the form of laws, but his power is still conceived as that will that can override every other will. Otherwise, it wouldn't be the will of a sovereign. But no. Power channeled into laws still remains at its core substantive force. As a consequence, reason, in terms of which political authority gains legitimacy, and that was a problem for them too, has to be imposed on the sovereign as a constraint from without one could uh, uh, show that even for Rousseau. In contrast, this, uh, in contrast to this conceptual strategy now, I have provided a uh, different starting point. We can already count on mechanisms and institutions which already process the risks of double contingency at a level below the evolutionary threshold of law and politics. Thus, we can from the outset understand social power to be an intersubjectively recognized source of influence, for instance in prestige systems, and also conceive of norms of action is somehow sacredly based on religious beliefs and morally binding. Proceeding from these assumptions, the concepts of law and politics can be then introduced in a two-step process. 
uh, the other half of the right uh, side. Uh, in the first step, normative authority can, on the one hand, arise by dint, by dint of social power, claiming to be based on previously recognized only morally binding norms. Sacred law, for instance, provides a resource for justice from which power can draw its legitimation. On the other hand, as soon as an education that is initially binding only in a moral sense is linked with factual power, moral law becomes transformed into socially binding law. Social power functions in this context as a resource for force from whence occupation counts in sanctioning power. So, the authorization of power by law and, on the other hand, the sanctioning of law by power must both occur uno acto. The fact that both moments are of simultaneous origin can, I mean, they demand each other conceptually. Um, uh, the fact that both moments in this sense are of simultaneous origin can, in a further step, explain the functions that legitimate power of political authority and sanctioned law or binding law fulfill for one another. Uh, down there on the right side. It is only on the second level that power and law both mutually constitute themselves as codes, each of which takes on a function of its own, a societal function of its own. Law serves once it lends political domination a legal form, to constitute a binary code of power. That simply means whoever disposes of our power can issue commands to others, whoever submits to such power has to obey. To this extent, law functions as an organizational means deployed by state authority. Conversely, power serves to the degree that it provides executive reinforcement for judicial decisions to constitute a binary legal code. Courts decide what is legal and what is not. To this extent, power provides law with a means of sanction. Now, it is these code-specific functions of uh, providing collectively binding decisions or a certain stabilization of behavioral expectations that explain why our thought experiment on rational collective will formation suggests that recourse be made to law and politics. The problem posed by whether someone can be reasonably expected to abide by morally justified norm can be solved with the aid of the legal code. And on the other hand, the problem of empowerment and how executed bodies can be placed under control can be solved with the power code. Of course, this does not yet answer the question of why such a conceptual experiment should be undertaken in the first place at all. Let us take a brief historical look back to the period when the uh, state system in uh, the modern state system in uh, 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 early Europe uh, uh, took uh, shape. In modernity, early modernity, with the decline of religious worldviews and the decline of the meta-social guarantees which these religious worldviews provided, Law and politics combined to form, so to say, a circular process. Seen from a purely functionalist perspective, law then is entirely absorbed, both 
by the contribution it makes to the power code to constitute it, and, on the other hand, by fulfilling the code function of its own. Better magnets. Viewed in this manner, the circular uh, process involving positive law and secularized power should be somehow able to rely on its own operations to stabilize itself. Now, in fact, empirically, this is not the case. Rather, the validity of positive law becomes paradoxical and a gap in legitimation opens up if we only describe this whole uh, complex of law and politics as an infrastructure of modern political systems and legal systems in functionless terms. How can, which are the problems? How can law that has since become positive law and can arbitrarily change meet with normative recognition on the side of its analyses and serve even more so as a legitimizing basis for political power despite its random changeability. That's one question. It's a paradoxical validity base of positive law. Legal positivism again and again failed to explain this problematic condition or rather deny its existence. I think that the problematic situation can be explained by the fact that the constitutive conditions for the complex of law and politics are or would be violated as soon as the law placed at the arbitrary disposition of some political legislator ceases or would cease to serve simultaneously as a source for justice. You see, I, I have uh, explained, so to say, this conceptual genetic stuff about it. And you see that some type of law has to go into the constitution, into the constitution of binding law. And uh, if uh, uh, the positivization of law uh, uh, succeeds to such an extent that this resource is, so to say, blocked uh, only then, uh, the uh, uh, paradox of validity uh, uh, comes up, shows up. Now, just as political power must rely on the concentration of coercive means, as a latent resource of force, so too law must remain in evidence also as a resource for justice. It is for this reason that the gap in legitimation opens up in that circular process which moves back and forth between instrumental power and instrumentalized law. It is this gap that contractarian theories had hoped to close with their taking recourse to practical reason. I mean, that was just the historical condition under which uh, this type of theory uh, uh, could make sense. And I think, I think that uh, conditions which are of interest for us didn't change since. So the problem remained, only the solutions are outmoded. Can do a plausible conclusion from the fact that the complex of law and politics off of its sacred foundation had been shaken. So he assumed that questions of justice underwent differentiation into moral and legal questions, and that law and politics both remain somehow intertwined with morality uh, all the same. So this is an anti-positivist position, of course. But Kant gave moral law the form of a rigid set of rules and principles superordinated to positive law. 
So, even if it may be possibly possible to ground such principles of natural law in terms of practical reason, they would either be too selective or not informative enough to meet the growing regulatory requirements of an increasingly complex and highly mobile, mobile society. I mean, natural uh, uh, law uh, concepts, even if they are justified on a post-conventional uh, level uh, with the ontological means, uh, are just too, uh, are just under complex. If even under these modern conditions, still the connection of practical reason to law and politics is not to be cut off at all, we must now view morality to be something that, uh, 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 we, we must not view morality to be something that is somehow uh, above law. Instead, we must assume that morality withdraws into procedures that themselves interpenetrate with positive law. In the following, I refer uh, to my paper that I gave yesterday. This course ethics deprives practical reason of all specific, substantive, normative contents and sublimates them into the form of a procedure for justifying possible normative contents. Furthermore, practical reason does not guide moral judgments only. It might well take its purest shape in procedural morality, but is by no means exhausted therein. In the first place, these causes of justification, the equivalent to the Kantian categorical imperative, have to rely on their supplementation by these causes of application because the idea of impartiality is only fully realized in the assessment of concrete uh, cases. Moreover, both types of discourse justification and application, are interwoven with pragmatic discourses as well as with bargaining processes and ethical, political discourses. I come back to that. Now, the legal institutionalization of this whole web of overlapping forms of communication means that legal processes and argumentative procedures interpenetrate and, and this is the important, mutually control each other. That's the basic idea which I'm going to illustrate. The legal process constrains the dynamics of negotiations and argumentations and distributes, for instance, the burden of proof, but it may not interview, intervene in the argumentational infrastructure. That is, in the interior of a discursive will formation which obeys an intrinsic logic of its own. Just as practical reason, so to say, outwits its weaknesses by encoding the results of moral reasoning in legal terms. So too, established law conversely outfits itself by means of the non-anticipated results of a logic of argumentation that has been legally licensed and enforced. Now let me, in the third step here, talk a bit about that inter interpenetration. Legal procedures regulate, for example, the access to and the role allocation in courts or in parliaments. They shape the type and course 
of negotiation and argumentation by, let's say, defining objectives, selecting issues and contributions, channeling decisions, and so on and so on. The means of positive law are used in a recursive manner in order to institutionalize discourses and negotiations that both produce and apply law. In so doing, two types of procedures and two types of procedural rationality intertwine. The results of legally institutionalized practices of negotiation and argumentation count as valid or as rational, precisely if they came about in conformity with the prescribed procedures. In this context, however, the conditions of pure procedural rationality, of course, cannot be fulfilled. Juridical as well as argumentative procedures presumably promote correct results, but they cannot guarantee that this is the case for obvious reasons. The idealized pragmatic presuppositions of argumentation in general can in any case only approximately be fulfilled and still allow for the possibility that justified beliefs accepted as valid for the time being be revised in the light of better argument tomorrow. And this fallibility holds true even more so for juridical procedures, which place modes of argumentation under the local, the social, and the temporal constraint of decision-making processes. Furthermore, in the case of argumentative procedures, there is no criterion for rule conformity that is not itself dependent on argumentation. Whether the demanding, the demanding communicative presuppositions have been sufficiently met in a given case can only be judged from within the perspective of participants. Juridical uh, procedures, however, can compensate for this very weakness by guaranteeing punctual unambiguous and binding results. In this case, whether or not legal procedural norms have been conformed to, in fact, can be checked from the viewpoint of an observer. So, the socially binding character borrowed from the legal code of result that has been achieved, achieved conforming to the prescribed procedures of argumentation substitute the guarantee of pure procedural rationality. In general, to sum up, this is a bit complicated, the legal institutionalization of rational collective will formation functions, if it functions at all, in such a manner that the discourses and their incomplete procedural rationality have, as Rawls puts it, a crazy pure procedural justice grafted onto them. The logic of argumentation is thus not immobilized, but rather, let me say, disciplined and employed, so as to produce reasonable and at the same time legally valid decisions and resolutions. Juridical discourses are a good example of uh, the intertwining of uh, these two uh, procedural times. I uh, will not go into this here. I mean, everybody who has uh, read, for instance, Dworkin, but there are uh, other equally convincing uh, um, uh, books and articles on this issue. Uh, Alexi, Arnio, Günther, uh, to take only uh, a few, will uh, realize that in hard cases, if you refer to legal discourses, in hard cases, uh, in spite of the finding of the whole procedure to the established law, to the law of the land, uh, 
uh, this uh, law does not uh, define a closed uh, universal discourse, but in her cases, uh, you uh, uh, can get onto uh, a argumentational uh, knot, so to say, where uh, you are rationally motivated to include uh, moral and policy uh, arguments. So you uh, see here beautifully uh, uh, which consequences uh, this intertwinement of legal procedures and logic of discourse, let me say, uh, here. However, a rational practice of education, that would be the first uh, example to analyze this whole uh, idea a bit more. However, a rational practice, a uh, would-be rational practice of education, uh, represents, even under idealized conditions, only the first stage in the procedural self-legitimation of law. The question whether statutes are themselves also valid in a normative sense, beyond the positivistic sense of uh, factual validity, must to a great extent be left unanswered within the legal system. This has rather to be proved at the further stage of legislation. The same intertwining of legal and argumentational procedures as we have seen to exist in the legal discourse must also establish itself in the domain of political information which is not governed by experts. So here it is much more difficult to imagine how it should work at all. What are the laws presumed to be valid in the legal discourse are also valid in the more demanding terms of practical reason, demands on the ration, uh, depends, excuse me, on the rationality of the legislative praxis. Statutes can lay claim to exhibiting such rationality only to the extent that they emanate and emerge from a democratic legislative procedure which would guarantee rational political reformation. I wish now, in the last part of my uh, paper, 10 more minutes, sorry. Uh, yeah, so. I wish to conceive of the democratic procedure as a legal institutionalization of those forms of communication necessary for rational political reformation. As we have seen, court procedure, no, I didn't go into it, but court procedure focuses on the preconditions of impartiality necessary for an appropriate and context-sensitive application of norms. Unlike now this administration of justice, both policy formation and legislation unfolds, however, in a complex matrix of practices of bargaining and argumentation in the strict sense. I'm, I'm not yet speaking empirically. I'm still moving completely in the realm of straight normative uh, 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 reasoning. A democratic procedure thus has to ensure simultaneously that several conditions for different forms of communication are met, namely the participatory conditions for negotiating fair compromises followed by let me just call it so. The sovereignty conditions for an authentic ascertainment of collective self-understanding. I have referred to that yesterday evening uh, uh, in the case of individual. 
grid formation. Now I am talking about collective grid formation. Uh, and finally, what has to be regarded as the autonomy as the autonomy conditions for moral discourses. I shall here disregard conditions for adequate information uh, processing and restrict myself to those aspects of bargaining, of ethical political self-understanding, and of moral justification. You see the same categories from yesterday that are relevant for the rational character of del deliberation on policies and laws. If we proceed beyond the question of what we can do with regard to the feasibility of programs, then rational political will formation must clarify three questions. First, the pragmatic question of how we can harmonize competing preferences. Secondly, the ethical political question of who we are and seriously want to be, as well as, finally, the moral practical question of how we should, uh, we should act, we are allowed to act. An aggregated will can result from fair bargaining processes in which different interests are weighed up against each other. An authentic common will can evolve from hermeneutic discourses of self-understanding, think of Bella and uh, other approaches. And an autonomous general will can be formed in moral discourses of justification and application. Now, as far as they are not taken care for in the legal system. Arguments take on different roles in such negotiations and discourses, and there are corresponding forms of communication in which the different types of discourse unfold. All of these forms of communication interpenetrate within the domain of what I call uh, rational collective uh, will formation with regard to policies and laws, I mean legislation. The evidence uh, when all these forms of communication evidence similar in the egalitarian surface structures. However, only a differentiated examination allows us to perceive that what seems to be similar forms of communication actually have to satisfy quite different conditions. Let me go through three types of communication which are interwoven in political will formation. First, as a form of communication, rational bargaining has to satisfy the procedural conditions that allow fair compromises can come about. Participation and the representation of those entitled to participate and additionally the conduct of the bargaining process, the role of the, the, the rota involved, and the length of the process, the specification of admissible topics, the sorts of contributions and arguments that are admissible, sanctions allowed, and so on, and so on. All this requires regulation. Such regulation must take equal account of all pertinent interests, must equip all the parties with equal power and restrict discussions given a sufficient flow of information to the pragmatic that is the most rational but morally indifferent pursuit of each party's own respective interest. Secondly, ethical political discourse. I'm talking about the communicative pragmatic preconditions for those settings in which ideally rational will formation of these three types become possible. I mean, that's at stake. Secondly, ethical political, uh, political discourse. Discourses are unlike bargaining processes, also geared somehow to cognitive purposes. They are dependent on a form of communication that satisfies the conditions under which members of a collective <coughs> 
gains the unrestrainedness as well as a self-confidence free of fear that are necessary if they are to be able to recognize and affirm who they are and who they wish to be, what life form they would prefer to share in common. Finally, moral discourses are tailored exclusively to cognitive purposes. They require a form of communication that allows only the rationally motivated force of the better argument to uh, persist. Participants are supposed to judge norms and policies solely from a viewpoint that gives equal consideration to the interests of all concerned and to accept justified proposals as binding. Resolutions are, as a consequence, only reached autonomously if they are motivated by insights into what one should do and not just one party should do. This particular artificial form of communication meets universal discourse, which, substanti which substantially fulfills cognitive functions, is, of course, the most sensitive to all interests and dependencies that intervene in the internal workings of argumentation. Now, in the light of the forms of communication of these three types, it is now possible, and with this I will finish, it is now possible to undertake uh, a uh, maybe a somehow strange interpretation of the people's, of the principle of people's sovereignty and the human rights. That is, of the normative substance of the democratic constitutional state, whereby these two components can be understood as now. The demand that those exacting forms of communication be legally institutionalized. I mean, I understand the well-known principles of our constitutional stage as saying you should under given condition as much as possible legally institutionalize those demanding uh, pragmatic presuppositions for a communication uh, process which enables these communication processes to emerge as fair bargaining processes, uh, enlightening uh, processes of authentic self-understanding and moral discourse. Now, first, free, equal, and secret elections are geared to the participatory conditions ensuring fair bargaining. The equal participation of all requires that the selection of uh, representatives be indeed as representative as possible, a selection that is intended then, I mean ideally of course, to guarantee that all interests and value orientations are brought to bear with equal stress. It's a power relation in the decision-making process. Secondly, the principle of people's sovereignty can, is however, I think, not exhausted by such an arrangement. By such an arrangement which allows the citizens to express themselves through the voice of their representatives uh, in view of their own interests. This is a uh, important and maybe the most important, at least the most visible part of it, but not the whole of it. With Rousseau, this principle of people's sovereignty can also be understood as a principle that the necessary communicative conditions be created for a hermeneutic process of collective self-understanding. Only under conditions of the direct, equal, and spontaneous 
participation of everybody in the public can that extent of ease, self-certainty, and the fearfully disposition to learn arise as much as it must exist if a dispute on strong evaluations is to develop into a conscious decision. Given that in complex societies like ours, it is not possible to fulfill the demand for immediate participation, strict, restri strict restrictions follow from the principle of people's sovereignty with regard to the selection, the composition, the business procedures, and most important, to the context of and in which the representative bodies operate. A discourse by representatives satisfies conditions for the equal participation at least indirectly to the extent that it remains open and sensitive and permeable to a public opinion arising from the grassroots of a more or less informed, pluralist, and spontaneous uh, public uh, sphere, which is pluralistically organized. Thirdly, the communicative conditions for moral practical discourses give rise to yet a different set of consequences. In this instance, the form of communication must satisfy conditions of autonomy, let me call it that way, under which each participant can expand his or her own perspective by drawing on the interpretive perspectives of all the other parties involved. Participation in communication rights, the political part of our human rights, can be understood as the principle to have such discourses of justification legally institutionalized. This class of traditional human rights demands that those communi communicative conditions which we necessarily presuppose to be fulfilled in practical discourses must be rendered operational and realized as far as possible. In effect, such conditions largely match the, uh, I mean, in effect, such conditions largely match the demands that derived from the principle of people's sovereignty. They have, however, a different meaning, namely that of providing the opportunities for discourses in which the participants can judge policies and norms from the moral point of view, and that is something different from the ethical point of view. Unlike in ethical, political discourses, the set of potential participants here in moral discourses is not limited to one's own collective. In other words, the members, uh, to the members of a particular community. It is humanity which provides the reference for human Rights. Now, what is left as a negative civil rights, I come to a close. The negative civil rights that originate from the liberal tradition have a different status. Viewed historically, they form, of course, the core of human rights, whereas political rights of participation and communication, as does the principle of people's sovereignty, go towards constituting the practices of bargaining and argumentation. Negative civil rights, by contrast, promote the self-limitation of such a practice. You see, it's an unliberal way to define liberal rights. As has been shown with reference to ethical and moral discourses, Rational political will formation would destroy its own communicative precondition if it were not to remain open to permeation by the informal cycle 
of political communication surrounding it in its environment. The public sphere can just as little be pressed into the pattern of a formal organization as can political culture in general. So legally constituted political will formation points beyond itself. Only formally organized bodies, of course, can decide. But they must remain open and sensitive to those communicative flows of autonomous public spheres that are spontaneous in origin and elude any legal institutionalization. It is on such a plane that a political culture moves, which has become both reflexive in character and, let me say, communicatively fluid. Institutionalized political will information, will information would destroy the basis for its own rational functioning if it were to pluck the sources of spontaneity inherent in an antecedent public sphere. Viewed in terms of discourse theory, negative civil rights compel the practice of rational political will formation to limit itself and prevent itself from puffing itself up as a seeming totality, deluding totality, and as the perfect center of society. So I'm sorry, it took more time the first time that I used this paper, and you see it's still in progress, and I know it was a heavy load. Uh, maybe we uh, talk a bit just about the, about the meaning of the whole approach. If you don't, if you shouldn't have more particular questions. Okay, Professor Pose, can you? Okay, try to. Is it, yeah. I mean, you, you have uh, nicely uh, put uh, what I uh, intended to say, although I, I wouldn't like to have it in such an immediately, in uh, such an immediate way applied to uh, uh, what I, uh, on a more sociological uh, plane, uh, discussed in the, at the end of the second volume. I mean, uh, let me just uh, place what I uh, locate what I uh, have been trying today. I mean, it is far off so far from any empirical analysis. And, and so uh, an, an immediate application would be um, perhaps misleading. I, I don't know whether you implied that, but uh, I, I, let me just say um, that uh, this is plain normative reasoning with certain, let me say, empirical, empirical informations uh, put in to the site door. Um, 
that means what this kind of reasoning can lead to if it succeeds at all is to make in the first step plausible in which sense uh, political will formation and, and, and legal decisions anyway could be claiming to meet more or less rational standards. Um, so far, I didn't even touch the level of institutionalization. The level of institutionalization. I came just to the point where I interpreted the well-known principles of our constitutions as normative guidelines for a possible institutionalization. So, that now, any institutionalization um, uh, which has to, uh, I mean, uh, uh, yield to uh, empirical constraints and functional requirements um, can take on uh, very uh, different forms. Uh, that means there are uh, many possible um, uh, institutional implementations of these uh, principles, and I would maintain that the traditional liberal idea of implementation in terms of a separation of powers is misleading because uh, there you have, I mean, this argument stems from the contractarian theory, so they, they somehow reason in a similar way, and then they have their principles, and then they thought uh, there is a one-to-one -one relationship between, for instance, discourses of application and discourses of justification, ethical self-understanding as far as it came into it at all, can be uh, uh, institutionalized uh, just by, by one power. So that they had uh, parliaments for legislation, courts for uh, education, uh, administration for the uh, uh, education. I'm sure that the whole um, uh, process, historical process, legal and political process of uh, uh, our political systems during the 19th century, at least since the last third of the 19th century, when it turns to corporate capitalism and the social welfare state, on the other hand, um, made it clear that this idea of a one-to-one -one relation between normative principles and their institutional realizations is false. You can easily see that your Supreme Court no, uh, thus uh, maintains legislative functions, which he is not allowed to, uh, and that uh, uh, parliaments nowadays partly uh, maintain uh, administrative functions, uh, while uh, administrations, and then as the core of the story, do maintain and presume all functions, terribly enough. So uh, I'm only pointing now to the fact that this is a first step. But if that repertoire could be sufficiently developed, you could use it now empirically for a critical reconstruction of actual processes, historical as well as uh, uh, present. So this was just to, uh, uh, let's say, um, insist that there shouldn't be a too quick uh, switch over from these normative uh, uh, considerations to whatever. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Without taking the additional step to institutionalization, uh, and saying on the theoretical level of your presentation, uh, do you have any thoughts on whether a theoretical answer can be 
as to which of these three functions of the function take precedence in what conditions, since they can and will conflict at various times. Namely, the conditions for pragmatic action coordination will be inconsistent with facilitating, for example, the discourse of morality. Um, and, and under those conditions of conflict, on a theoretical level, have you any thoughts about uh, how we should resolve? Yeah, and it's also on the theoretical level, not, not speaking of any historical evidences. I mean, uh, already a, a difficult um, question. Um, I, I touched it yesterday evening uh, on the parallel plane of individual will formation. Um, I mean, there are cases, to illustrate your question, where questions are treated as pragmatic ones to be settled uh, through negotiations, fair or not, that in fact are, no, are not pragmatic questions, but uh, either moral or uh, ethical uh, ones. I mean, uh, many uh, ecological uh, issues uh, of this uh, kind. Uh, um, all uh, civil rights issues, of course, uh, are of that kind, and they, of course, the progresses are nevertheless usually made by uh, via uh, the power play of uh, less and more fair compromises. Um, so, not speaking on that, uh, what is empirically happening. Theoretically, I think yes, that there is not just this multiplicity of uh, pragmatic, ethical, and moral questions, but that it is, after all, the same forceless force of reason which we bring to the problems in order to solve them. So it is by no means accidental that arguments always enter the scene, even in very different role, and even in negotiations. It's very interesting to see, uh, to analyze which role arguments should play in such a power-defined game, and nevertheless, I don't think that it is true that they only play the role of uh, post hoc justification. They do that most of the time, uh, but they are not meant to be so, uh, to do that. And because uh, it is the same kind of reason, practical reason, that we bring to bear on our practical problems in all these fields, I do think that to the extent that we would succeed to implement practical reason in a highly differentiated way into uh, our institutional uh, uh, workings of uh, collective will formation, that to this extent it would turn out where to locate the selection mechanisms, which, so to say, uh, order types of questions as to their proper place, so that it is no longer up to individuals who debate about this, which is which problem. Uh, this is an intuition, I, I mean, I, I, I had to give another lecture in order to explain this idea, but the intuition should be clear. That uh, I, I do think that this uh, communicative approach is somehow designed to, to place uh, reasonable operations out there in the sphere of the objective mind to speak with Hegel. 
uh, means uh, out there on the institutional level and to put uh, questions which we face to be just questions to be solved in our minds singularly, uh, to place them on to a uh, cooperative level. Yeah, this is not a very satisfying answer, I know. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next, yeah, okay. First and then second, yeah. Please. Uh, you said a tremendous amount about reason and its practical employment. That kind of also subsumed reason and its theoretical employment to a large degree under reason and its practical employment when it comes to dealing with the world. I wonder if you share Franz's view that reason and its practical employment in a way uh, coordinates reason and its theoretical employment when it comes to human action. In other words, is reason and its theoretical employment means for gaining knowledge subsumed to a large measure within reason and its practical employment is used to Kant? I mean, you uh, start from a certain reading of Kant. Uh, as you well know, which is quite debated. I mean, this reading is inspired by Fichte and others who uh, make the arguments that uh, theoretical reason is somehow part of the practical. And that was then the main line, at least leading to Marx, if not to Hegel. Uh, the question is what uh, stand I do uh, take on this. I, I, I think that the question uh, doesn't pose itself in the same way. If you leave uh, the whole design of a philosophy of the subject, I mean, there you have faculties, theoretical, practical, aesthetic, and then you ask for coordination. Uh, once you transpose these faculties, to the very communicative enabling conditions for these courses which are designed to uh, have participants solve their problems, then, uh, I mean, you have the competition between types of discourses. And no longer, I mean, this focused uh, question of who uh, uh, dominates who. And I want uh, think that uh, we have to leave uh, much uh, space for contingencies. And I do think that it depends on uh, situations and problems, if not even cultural particularities, when which time of this course will justifiably, not just in fact, go to lead the others. So I uh, have no answer to that, a uh, fortiori. You've indicated that much of your other work uh, concerned for the practices or the power relationships which corrupt the result of domination and uh, departures from the kind of uh, moral standard to life in the community. I'm just curious in this constitution of yours, or this framework of yours, what, what you think of the areas where uh, corruption is the most likely to show itself? Uh, and uh, what would be the measures you might take to uh, try to anticipate in uh, avoiding I mean, corruption in the narrow sense, and this might not be implied in your uh, vote, Corrup corruption in the narrow, the narrow sense is not very important and sometimes uh, serves uh, good functions. Because uh, corruption in the narrow sense uh, is more tied up to uh, personality failures and, and uh, such things. But corruption in uh, a more objective or structural sense. Now, um, uh, is 
in my analysis, but please, I mean, this is just one proposal and it competes with many other proposals. Structural corruptions um, are most important when in societies like ours, certain um, large scale necessary, non-substitutable functions are fulfilled with means which are not uh, designed for uh, fulfilling just these functions. Now, this is an abstract formulation. Uh, I'm, I think that uh, uh, as well bureaucratization as legalization is commercialization of processes that are designed to raise children, socialization, to educate people, transmission of traditions, or to integrate people or groups socially, that they have a disrupting, a structurally disruptive uh, effect. Um, now, uh, uh, a second, um, in my view, I mean, I, I have written something on, on bureaucratization and commodification and legalization, I mean, that is, so to say, on the colonization of spheres of life which uh, should be communicatively uh, organized and uh, somehow integrated via intentional actions and not so much via uh, mechanisms like money and power, I mean. So this is one um, uh, part of my answer. Now the other part of my answer would be, and is more related to what I said uh, this afternoon, is that, uh, yeah, the public sphere that's an old topic of mine, of course, that the pu public sphere is deformed. I mean, not just by dumb people, I mean. That we can stand, I mean, if functions are more or less, I mean, uh, uh, working, uh, we can uh, carry uh, even a uh, lot of, uh, I mean, more or less uh, incapable incapable persons. But um, what I am here uh, hinting at is more the structural deformation of the public sphere. Now there is one point which I would like to stress once more. No. Uh, conventional political theory, also the normative one, uh, not only to how institutions should be organized. Now, one of my consequences is that, for instance, the democratic procedure, procedure of political will formation in, in a normatively demanding way uh, can only be institutionalized in deliberating bodies, let's say parliament, whatever bodies, on whatever level, if they remain responsive. Now that had to be explained, of course. If they remain responsive to uh, the flows of communication, to the communication processes in their environment, which cannot be institutionalized. Now, what can they be? They are organized in a way. Of course, I mean, we have medias, we have uh, um, uh, papers, we have uh, publishing houses, we have uh, uh, yeah, parties uh, in one of their minor functions, I mean, are parts of uh, 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 organizations in the public sphere. But the problem is that uh, 
in the public sphere, as we should uh, use the plural of it, that the public spheres um, are not designed for decision making, but only for opinion formation. So they are released from uh, those functions for which you need bodies, for which you need institutions. So they can develop into networks of informally organized flows of communications, which are even much more, I mean, uh, 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 grassroots um, supported than any institutionalized, although more balanced form of uh, opinion uh, formation. So, and if you think from a normative point of view uh, of this condition, then it is, of course, detrimentous. What is it detrimental? Or is it, uh, yeah, it is practical. Uh, uh, when you see uh, how uh, what is really happening in, in the public spheres, uh, and uh, if you see the degree of organization and even institutionalization in the formal sense of, uh, of uh, what should be left uh, on a low level of organization and of uh, uh, not being institutionalized. So these are two spheres where I do see uh, uh, dangers, uh, not only, but, uh, yeah, um, counter tendencies to what, uh, to those tendencies which, which one might detect in support of uh, what I have here normatively uh, explained. Yeah, yeah, it's a legitimation function, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we have these uh, nice uh, campaign studies in political science and sociology. We have uh, electoral sociological studies, and uh, there are uh, the issues uh, more clearly defined. Uh, which are at stake. We have media research, um, and since Lazarus said, I mean, it's uh, developed a bit into mass communication, not so much as one would like. Anyhow, uh, these are uh, all uh, areas in which uh, there is an established research with uh, many empirical data, and I one thing that uh, uh, a uh, theoretical perspective like mine could be useful in somehow reorganizing these data and uh, reconstructing a bit uh, what is going on in uh, these spheres. Now, um, uh, that means that one has to get down from these normative heights to um, uh, uh, empirical analysis of uh, uh, social processes. For instance, I would say that from a normative point of view, it would be already as a necessary con condition for the well functioning of parliamentary bodies that are institutionalized, it would be necessary to um, shield, uh, first to have, and let's spring, and then to shield uh, what one might call uh, autonomous uh, public spheres. Autonomous public spheres, I call those spheres in which you have a certain degree of organization. Namely, a degree of organization below the level of 
a civilized organization which can be defined by the fact that the functions of the organization are different from the intentions of their members. Now, exactly this condition for a large-scale organization is, so to say, normatively, normatively speaking, not allowed for organizations which would fulfill uh, the function of uh, shielding um, more or less non-repressive communication processes within the public sphere. So, I mean, starting from these points, I mean, I, there, are, there are many points, which one, this is just an example. Starting from those points, one could then, so to say, interpret the empirical material in uh, describing, so to say, uh, which uh, the tendencies to and against what one could postulate as the implementation of practical reason in uh, the public sphere. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm a little bit concerned by the ease with which you move from the question of individual will formation to the question of collective will formation. It seems as if there's no centrally different, different phenomenology about the collectivity uh, that would differentiate from that of the individual. And I wonder how this program of normative reasoning, how or whether this program of normative reasoning could take into account certain claims that have been made about the nature of groups and collectivities by psychologists, sociologists, for instance, of uh, Freud, for instance, or Durkheim, or Ortega on minorities and masses, uh, and whether or not it, it would be possible uh, to take those into account and still preserve the goal of goals of legitimation uh, within the general framework of normative reasoning. I mean, two things. Uh, first, uh, already on the normative level, I, uh, I didn't explain this sufficiently today. I lay a stress, if that is an English word, I mean, uh, on uh, leaving behind the conceptual machinery of what I call the philosophy of the subject. That means it would be exactly the mistake I want at least an attempt to avoid if I would project structures of individual information just on the large scale. I mean, this is what we have in Hegel and in Marx and uh, in many others, of course, where Volksgeister and classes are just uh, Mako subjects. And that leads analytically into a good sac. Now, instead, I uh, uh, propose to um, make the transition from uh, individual will formation to collective will formation in such a way that I already interpret individual will formation is, Vygotsky, me, and so on, uh, an internalized form or mirror of uh, a, uh, an intersubjective practice of uh, me and bargaining or reasoning. Uh, and then the danger is at least less great uh, you can conceive from the very beginning um, collective will formation not as something attributed to an entity, but as something that is described in uh, structural terms, referring in the first place to uh, linguistic uh, 
teacher said, ah, or pragmatic presupposition or whatever, which are from the very beginning shared, or supposed to be shared, by participants. So that, I mean, state, the state. I mean, in Germany, we have this powerful, I mean, Da weiß man noch, was der Staat ist. I mean, it's, in, it's interesting that in the English speaking world, world, you don't have this nice concept. I mean, the state. I mean, the state was always supposed uh, to be the Leviathan or some substitute of it, or some variation of it. You can no longer, longer think of it as a, as a subject. Maybe we do think of it as a system, but then, what I'm talking about here on the level of the legitimation process, uh, it is higher order intersubjectivity of which we talk and not make all subjects. Now, secondly, uh, uh, this uh, channel, so to say, is a conceptual route uh, on which one can employ empirical knowledge such as so, of a social psychological Freudian, Piagetian, or uh, otherwise kind. Yeah? Oh, you mean uh, now the group dynamics uh, studies and, 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 and this, uh, I mean, maybe related things. I, I, I'm not sure what you are particularly thinking of. I think that uh, uh, this type of empirical research um, could and should be linked to uh, a more linguistically oriented analysis of communication processes. I mean. But I mean, that now is a different discussion. I mean. But I see the problem. I, I, I totally agree that this should be attempted. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Conflict and discourse with other societies, other methods, not play any role in, in theoretical process and collective document? You mean also politics, foreign policy, to put it uh, as an example. Other, other, uh, you mean uh, without the uh, gro without the group at, at stake? I mean, being a nation or being a just uh, a neighborhood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting question because that was the original question of Hobbes, wasn't it? Uh, 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 uh. I mean, it is a question of, uh, uh, you see, I'm slightly evading, uh, uh, of anthropological pessimists, I mean, just to put it in history of ideas. Uh. I mean, uh, uh, you see, uh, if you are an anthropological pessimist, you uh, describe the boundary conditions that means in the old con constructions of the natural state, in those terms that uh, contingencies uh, and dangers are on a high level. That means risk-producing mechanisms are vivid. I mean, uh, homo homini lupus. While uh, Locke, I mean, and others also, no, not also, I mean. Uh, 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 playing that down. Now, uh, and, and if you stress foreign relations, you are on the side of uh, the pessimists, and if you start, you, you have the same game in history, those who speak of the primacy of interior policy versus the primacy of external policy. It's the same game. Anyhow, um, uh, let me put it uh, now uh, in, in a serious way. I mean, uh, I mean on my side in a serious way. Um, one could object 
to that whole approach, even if one grants the meaning of normative reasoning, which I only introduce because I am almost sick of uh, functionalist and contextualist analysis of how courts work and how uh, parliaments work and so on and so on, and I do think that this whole approach is just less than half of the story. That's just for the empirical motivation. Anyhow, uh, even if one grants the meaning of uh, this normative approach, one can easily object, and I accept it, that, of course, action coordination is provided, in fact, more by uh, non-intentional than by intentional mechanisms. That means this, all of this, concentrates on the question how could participants intentionally solve these types of problems. And it's necessary, of course, if you want to implement practical or see uh, practical reason implemented. Anyhow, now, uh, there you have this objection. How is it with uh, systems mechanism like the market, I mean, the, the, the first uh, candidate, uh, power codes, uh, uh, any institution has organizational devices that work unintentionally. And uh, uh, first, I would accept it. It is, of course, clear that uh, that set of problems is coped with, let me say, on both trails. Now, for foreign relationships, it is so that um, in case of conflicts of this type, um, you need even, this is an empirical argument, you need even more than for internal conflicts, systematic, systematic non-intentional coordination mechanisms in spite of the appearance of diplomacy and, and all that, I mean. Now, uh, so I want, in the first step, I answer you, this is taken care for by other types of mechanisms. Now, then you can, in the second step, object okay, and say, but if that is so, why start with that uh, type of business at all? And then I have to answer, uh, or can answer if I want to defend myself, uh, with an empirical argument. I do think that the growth in complexity in modern societies work in, works in those dimensions. It is at the same time that systems mechanisms like money and power, in fact, do absorb more and more of the variety uh, or the risks or however you want to describe it. But at the same time, to the same extent even, I would at least intuitively suggest, the level of reflexivity also raises, that means, because of the um, the differentiation of institutions of an older type, like church and army, uh, you have at the same time a growth in problems that are just brought upon the minds of those experts and the people. So uh, that, uh, I mean, 
I do see a certain division of labor, sociologically speaking, between the intentional and the non-intentional uh, procedures of coping with coordination problems. But uh, uh, the empirical trend I, I would argue for, I mean, with empirical indicators at least, shows us that uh, both is equally uh, demanded and so uh, uh, the uh, pointing to external things and so on uh, would fit somehow or would, take, would, would be taken into consideration within this enlarged picture. You, you see. We have, it's uh, four o'clock and uh, we've had a ask uh, Professor Habermas a lot of questions, and I want to thank him very much for his talk and for his answers. <laughs>